Welcome to the third of these talks looking at quantitative data and the analysis of quantitative data. And in this session, I'm going to try and introduce some of the core principles behind statistical analysis. Our aims and objectives for today are to identify the principles and practices of quantitative data analysis. To do this, we will look at the core principles within the descriptive presentation of research data. We will also look at common statistical tests using quantitative research. We'll also look at common errors in reporting statistical findings. And we'll discuss a little bit about the relationship between statistical significance and clinical significance. So thinking back to our diagram, we have a research problem. We've then developed our research hypothesis and our null hypothesis from that. We'll have considered what variables we want to assess, what our sample may be, what type of data we want to collect. And we'll do this with one eye on the type of data analysis that we like to perform. And that's what we're covering in this session. Data analysis can be a powerful tool, but it's only as good as the research questions we have, the operational definitions, our data collection instruments, and the quality of the original data. There are many ways that we can use the same data, and it's important to make sure that we use the data correctly. We have two types of data, primary data and secondary data. Primary data is that which we collect from research activity such as the collecting of measurements, whether levels of biological indicators or responses from questionnaires. Secondary data is that which already exists and may be taken from prior research in which study leads have made their raw data available for further examination. This type of analysis is becoming more common, especially as research which is publicly funded often has a requirement that the researchers make their data publicly available. So then we have to think about the levels of data. So within our data, whether primary or secondary, there can be four different types of data. Firstly, we have nominal data, which is a categorical type of data, which as the name suggests, is data which can be broken down into categories, such as the number of people with blue eyes or brown eyes, the breakdown of a population into genders, or where, for example, you may be living. These aspects within each category may be related, but order is not important between the groups. So blue eyes are not better than brown, female not better than male, and so on and so forth. The next level of data we have is ordinal data. Again, this is categorical data, but here order is important. So we can write the responses, but there is no standard unit of measurement or valuation between the categories. So I find it easiest to think about this thinking of medals. So we know a gold medal is more highly rated than a silver or bronze, but we can't say that a gold is two or three times better than a silver. Equally, if we think of the difference between first, second and third in a race, the difference between first place and second place may be two meters, but between second and third, it could be four, eight, 20. The next level of data is interval data, which is scale data. So this is where units of measurements can be seen to be equally spaced at equal intervals. But within scale data, there is no true or absolute zero. So we can think of a temperature scale for this. Zero degrees Celsius doesn't mean an absence of temperature. It's just a recording. Likert scales can be interval, although some researchers categorize these as ordinal types of scales as they have a rank order and may have an uneven distribution. Lastly, we have ratio scales. So the difference between an interval and ratio scale is that interval scales have incremental increases, but these may not be of the same magnitude. For example, we could argue that 10 degrees Celsius is not quite as hot as 5 degrees Celsius that heat is a somewhat relatively subjective concept. However, as weight is a ratio of scale, we can say that 10 kilograms is twice as heavy as five kilograms. Ratio scales have a true zero. That is, when the score is zero, there is an absence of that variable. So again, 
zero degrees Celsius is a measure of the temperature. Zero degrees kilogram is no kilograms. Ratio scales also have no negatives. So zero degrees Kelvin, which is actually a temperature scale, is a ratio scale, but that actually means an absence of any thermal energy. So this table may be helpful in thinking about our levels of data. We have categorical data, which is nominal and ordinal, and then we can have scale data, which is interval or ratio. The level of data is important for what types of tests we do. So now we know about data levels, let's look at analysis. We have our data and we can examine it in different ways to make sense of it and potentially address our research question. The data we have we can manipulate in two different ways and this largely falls down into descriptive or inferential. Descriptive analysis will paint a picture of the data for us an inferential analysis will allow us to test hypotheses, explore possible relationships and find differences. Descriptive statistics organise and summarise the characteristics of a data set. So that is the responses that we record from observations or from our study. After collecting data, the first step of statistical analysis is to describe the characteristics or distribution of the data. This can be done through tables such as we've seen in talk two that outline frequencies or counts or through charts and graphs. Measures of central tendency estimate the center or average of a data set, and these include the mean, median and mode, and there are three ways of telling us about the properties within the data. Central tendencies are another way of say, saying where most of the data values lie. And here we can see that our data distribution is normal in that it forms a nice and symmetric bell curve where the majority of data clusters around the mean and less data points at the extreme ends of the measure. So we would call this type of distribution parametric. So here's an example of data, which is pain scores taken from 25 patients on a ward in a hospital. We can represent the data graphically, and from this we can see what looks like a normal distribution. We can also see from this how close the mean, median and mode are together. There are other statistics that will tell us about the data distribution, such as kurtosis and skew, but those are potentially for another day. But here, interestingly, we see that the mean score is very central within the distribution of the data. But if our data is not normally distributed, we will get separated measures of central tendency. Here we can see that where our data is skewed, our mean, mode and median are separated. So we need to understand how the data is distributed. So this skew here, we would call non-parametric data and it will affect what types of statistical tests we can apply. So here, within the same ward, but scores taken on a different day, we can see that from the histogram, the data looks skewed. Equally, we can see that the mean, mode and median are not so closely clustered. Our sample will never be a perfect representation of the population. Different samples from the same population will give different results, and this is called sampling error. Standard deviation tells us how much data from the same sample vary around the mean of the sample. The standard deviation is the average amount of variability in your data set. It tells you on average how far each score lies from the mean. In normal distributions, a high standard deviation means that values are generally far from the mean while a low standard deviation indicates that values are clustered close to the mean. Another key concept is standard error. Standard error tells us how different the population mean is likely to be from a sample mean. It tells you how much the sample mean would vary if you were to repeat the study using new samples from within a single population. Lastly, confidence intervals calculate a range from our sample where we can be confident that the population mean 
or sometimes other parameters, lie. If we construct a confidence interval with a 90% confidence level, you can be confident that 95 times out of 100, the estimate will fall between the upper and lower values specified by the confidence interval. So if you reproduce that sample or experiment repeatedly, 95% of the time, you would see the same results if you counted the total population. Again, here in our normally distributed data sample, we can see the measures of central tendency are similar and that our standard deviation and confidence intervals are tied to the mean. And here in our normally distributed data, we can see that the measures of central tendency are disparate. And similarly, our standard deviation is larger and our confidence intervals are much further apart. So in summary, we've covered key aspects of descriptive data analysis. We've looked at the types of data, and here we can use the acronym NOIR, N-O-I-R, to remember the levels of data, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. We've looked at measures of central tendency and what they tell us about the data. We've looked at data distribution and the importance of knowing whether our data is normally distributed. So now let's look at some common statistical tests that you may see in research studies. We don't have time to cover each in depth, but hopefully this will introduce key elements of each. If we think back to the model we've been using, the circular model looking at the scientific method, we're still effectively in the design phase of our study, but we need to think forward to when we have data, what type of statistical tests may we use? These questions here may be helpful in deciding what tests we can use. So in previous talks, we've covered different types of variables and also the number of variables we may be examining. So here, univariate just means one variable, bivariate where we may be comparing two variables, or multivariate where we may be comparing a number of variables. We've also covered the levels of data. We've also looked at descriptive data and data distribution whether data is parametric or non-parametric. So now we need to look at tests of the data and we must ask, do I have a single group or paired groups? If we think back to the step wedge study design when we looked at quasi-experimental studies, that was a good illustration of a study that has both within group analysis, so comparing groups that may have a pre and post test score, and between group analysis, so comparing one group with a control or another group. Then we want to be thinking about, are we looking for a relationship between our groups or differences between them? In most of the tests, we'll be looking to see if the means of groups are different or if there is a relationship between two variables. Using tests, we try to reject the null hypothesis. Rejecting the null hypothesis does not prove the research hypothesis, it just provides evidence to support it. In most of the tests you use, we will generate a p-value. p-value stands for probability. So if your p-value is 0.05, that means 5% of the time you would see your results if the null hypothesis was true. Predetermined levels of significance for rejecting the null hypothesis are normally at the 0.05 level. So that is where there is less than 5% chance you would see the results if the null hypothesis were true. So we set a standard critical value that must be met for us to claim that something interesting has occurred. So this is like setting a benchmark to achieve. Again, this is usually set at 0.05. If one test is performed, there is a 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis, but in fact, the null hypothesis is true. In some cases, researchers choose a more conservative level of significance, such as 0.01. This minimizes the risk of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. And this raises the issue of statistical significance and clinical significance. The two are not always the same. For example, if we have a very large sample, a difference of one point in a pain scale may actually be statistically significant. But we could argue that is that really making a difference? So clinical significance is when a treatment is considered to be substantially improving the lives of patients. And there can sometimes be a difference between what is clinically significant and what is statistically significant. With our data and p-values, 
we decide whether the null hypothesis can be rejected. As these decisions are based on probabilities, there is always a risk of making the wrong conclusion. If your results show statistical significance, that means they are very unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis is true, less than 5% of the time. In this case, you would reject your null hypothesis. But sometimes this may actually be an error, which we call a type 1 error. We conclude there was an effect when there actually was none. If your findings do not show statistical significance, they have a high chance of occurring if the null hypothesis is true. Therefore, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. But sometimes this could be an error also, which is a type 2 error. We fail to conclude there was an effect when there actually was. Statistical power is the probability that the tests correctly reject the null hypothesis. The higher the statistical power, the lower the probability of making a type 2 error, so the probability of accepting the alternative hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. Study power is usually calculated prior to data collection as it helps to identify the smallest sample size required to detect an effect. So let's start to look at some statistical tests using quantitative data. And let's start with differences in comparing two groups of normally distributed data. We can only compare two means if the dependent variable or scale data, so that is interval or ratio data. The most common test to compare means are t-tests. So here the independent variable will be nominal, for example, was a patient in an experimental or control group, and the dependent variable a score, such as a pain score. T-tests assume that the data follow a normal distribution and t-tests are parametric tests. So a one sample t-test tests the difference between a single group, which is their mean, against a set value from a wider population. So the mean average of one group is compared against the wider group average. So if we had pain scores from our ward, we may want to look at how the pain scores differ from that across the wider hospital. For this, we need to have an estimation of what the wider score is from across the hospital. And here the null hypothesis is that the population mean doesn't equal the specified mean value from our sample. An independent t-test is for when we want to see if there's a difference between two independent groups. So in our ward we may look to see if there's a difference in the pain scores between men and women. A paired sample t-test is used to compare a single group before and after some intervention, measured at two different points in time. So in our ward, we may look to see if there's a difference in pain scores after the introduction of a new service. However, as we've seen with non-parametric data, the mean score may not be a very helpful measure. Here, we may need to use different tests if we have non-parametric data. These tests do not assume normally distributed data or equal variance and are therefore based on medians and not means. Now, if we have a large enough sample, over 30, statisticians argue that we can use t-tests even if the data is not normally distributed. But here, I'll highlight the equivalent non-parametric test for information. So, a one-sample Wilcoxon tests whether a population median is equal to a hypothesized median. The Man Whitney New Test tests medians from two independent or unrelated groups. And the Wilcoxon Signed Rank tests test population medians from the same group at two different points of time. So, back to parametric data, and when we have more than two groups, we can use a one way ANOVA. This will compare the mean of three or more groups and the effect of an independent variable on three dependent variables. So we may look at an effect of exercise in patients in a high, low and medium exercise groupings, which is our independent variable. And we want to see the effect of exercise on fatigue, which is our dependent variable. ANOVA determines whether the groups are different by calculating whether their means are different from the overall mean of the dependent variable. If any of the group means is significantly different from the overall mean, 
then the null hypothesis is rejected. The non-parametric version of the Wormy ANOVA is the Kruskal-Wallis test. Where we have two independent variables and more than two groups, we can use a two-way ANOVA. So in our example, if we look at gender and exercise on fatigue, we can use a two-way ANOVA. This generates three hy hypotheses. Null hypothesis one is that there's no difference in the means of the exercise groups. Null hypothesis two is that there's no difference in the means of gender groups. And null hypothesis three is that there's no interaction effect between gender and exercise. We still need the same assumptions as a one-way ANOVA, that we have independent data, normal distribution, and homogeneity of variance. But there's no real non-parametric way to do the two-way ANOVA, but if we collect 30 plus observations in each group and keep them relatively equal, we can use a two-way ANOVA. Much like with t-tests, if we have sample sizes of over 30, or non-parametric data, it's argued we can use t-tests. We've looked at how we may assess the differences between groups. Now let's have a look at assessing the relationship between groups or different variables. If we have interval or ratio data, we can perform correlations. As we discussed in the study design session, correlations look at the relationship between two variables, but make no distinction between them and they do not imply causality. For parametric data, we have two sets of normally distributed scale data, and we use Pearson's correlation. For non-parametric data, two sets of non-normally distributed data, we use Spearman's rank, or sometimes what's called Spearman's row. And our null hypothesis is that there is no relationship between the variables we are measuring, for example, pain and fatigue. If we don't have scale data, but have categorical data, we can use a different technique, chi-square. Chi-square tests whether the observed frequency distribution of a categorical variable is significantly different from its expected frequency. So, for example, if we want to know whether more male than female patients attend the exercise class, we can use chi-square. Chi-square are non-parametric and measure expected outcomes by observed outcome. With two categorical variables, you can use a contingency table to show observations. The chi-square will test whether the observed frequencies are significantly different from what was expected. So here we may expect that we will have equal number of patients attending the exercise class. Goodness of fit can test whether the observed frequencies are significantly different from the frequencies expected if gender is not related to exercise. Let us now move on to a more powerful type of statistical test, which allows us to make predictions of the effect of one variable on another, regression analysis. Regression models describe the relationship between variables, and it does this by calculating a regression line within the observed data. Linear regression models use a straight line, while logistic and nonlinear regression models use a curved line. Regression allows us to estimate how a dependent variable changes as the independent variable or variables change. So simple linear regression is used to estimate the relationship between two quantitative variables. So we could use simple linear regression where we want to know, for example, how fatigue, which is our independent variable, affects pain, which may be our dependent variable, or the value of a dependent variable, pain, what that is, dependent upon the certain level of fatigue. The data must have certain conditions, so the variances must be equal, there must be independent observations, must be normally distributed data, and we must have an assumption that the data is linear. But we realise that there may be other many other independent variables that may have an effect, mood for example, and where this is the case we can perform a mul multiple linear regression. If we have binary or dichotomous variables, such as the presence or absence of pain, we could use logistic regression. So just a note on correlation regression. Where correlation works both ways, we can swap the variables 
we can't do this with regression. Regression doesn't work this way. We can't swap the variables around. So we've now worked through all the elements to enable us to design our experiment. And the next steps are collecting the data and putting our analysis into practice. We've covered a lot in this session regarding quantitative analysis, but I hope this may be a starting point for some further investigations and looking at the different types of tests we can use. I hope these sessions have been helpful. We've not covered every aspect that we possibly could, but again, hope this is a starting point for a better understanding of quantitative data and the approaches to its analysis. Thank you.